why don't we just start off by talking about how you both got into sculpture? Well, I, both of us started in sculpture. I mean, um, on a graduate, you know, uh, uh, and graduate uh, work, I was a sculptor, uh, painting major, sculptor minor. So there's always been the interest, and Susan started out as a sculpture major. And um, so, I mean, the interest has always been there, and we've always dabbled, but as painters often dabble, it's... Uh, you know, an extra when you got time, since I'm so ambitious about my painting, there was hardly time for dabbling in, in something as major as a whole other uh, discipline. And uh, till, uh, <clears throat> and, and so it, both of us had done sculptural things um, throughout our careers, but you know, a, a run of two or three isolated things here because of a particular material or some suggestion or opportunity or sometimes a, even a longer run when we got into the concrete that started in in 94 we started making the concrete and that led not right away but slowly that just grew and grew until we were pursuing the concrete after 10 years pretty seriously and ended up coming up with the synthetic stone and so on. But the steel we did because again of the opportunity and we had the opportunity to um, work in steel because of a friend who put a, a studio together. Liked the kibitz on artist work in progress and wanted us to come and work in his studio so that he could. <laughs> and. Um, you know, we first were mildly interested, but it was just something fun to do, uh, to just to try. And uh, then I'm going to let Susan take over because Susan, in that moment, we were both just trying for the first couple of years and coming up with sort of the usual of its, uh, you know, assembled constructivist. Uh, well, steel sculpture. You know, Daryl had a mission. He had already. He had. <clears throat> he already had a voice. He had already sold a piece. Um, that piece was vandalized and stolen, and so he already had someone interested. If he could ever do something similar to what had been lost to this collector, so he had a mission. Um, and, and a voice. I thought I'd give it a try, and I wasn't happy with the results, and was prepared to give it up. Um, and because I didn't want to disappoint my friend, I think I told you this story. Did I tell you this story? I think I did. But maybe not on tape. Maybe, I'm not sure. Um, yeah. Anyway, um, if it's on tape, we'll find out later. <laughs> yeah. Um, I if I didn't have something to add, I wasn't much interested in making more stuff. You get to a certain point. <clears throat> I got to a certain point where you have a lot of stuff accumulated for a lifetime of making objects, and then you have the caretaking of these objects. And if you're not making objects that you feel very, very strongly about, you best think about these things that you're making. You're not, you know, what are you going to do with them? How are you going to store them? Where are you going to put them? So I made the decision to stop and was very happy to go when Daryl was working and, uh, you know, cook for everybody and read. And I'd had this injury, and I was happy to rest. This place is a lot of work. And um, I had the sense that I was disappointing my friend. So I proceeded to go to the studio to do something. And I didn't know how it was going to be different. So on the way over there, I made the decision that I would pretend that I was painted. 
And that's how these, paint, these steel works came to be. Um, there's a lot of uh, serendipity that happens in art making, and certainly the making of the, the steel for me has a lot of that included in it. Um, I left sculpture uh, as a young person because it seemed to be a team sport, and I'm a loner by nature, and, and I didn't see that I could play well with others. And in those years, I was the only female at the foundry and all of it. It was not a comfortable situation. And, um, and I also had ideas for color that I wasn't sure that sculpture was prepared I was prepared in sculpture to talk to. So uh, I moved to painting, but it's obvious from the kind of pi pi picture making that I'm involved in that, you know, sculpture or uh, bar relief or um, uh, any other, con there's been a lot of language associated with my picture making. But in any case, it certainly talks to shadows and shadows really are more about sculpture than they are about painting. And I'm very interested in shadows. So that, that's how it started. Um, and now it's a very important part of my oeuvre. I'm going to add something that you, you didn't mention that, uh, about your longtime interest in coming out of sculpture, uh, that your process is very much like David Smith's process of assembling these parts that you don't put together right away, that you assemble in a pile on the floor, you know, with in, in a sort of an anti-gravity space first, and study and assemble and whatever, and then, like a Zen artist, when the moment is right because something clicks, okay, I got I got all the parts and I see it. And then you, and, and then she, you know, brings it up. Well, that's what she's doing in the sculpture. But she's always done that in her painting since she's been doing collage. It's been that same kind of thing, even assembled on the floor, very much out of, similar to, and out of uh, David Smith process, which is a sculpture process, or at least an assemblage sculpture process, which is, you know, who we, what he championed, what he worked out of, and, and was so wonderful at. So That is definitely, you know, where I'm working out of. Um, Smith isn't the only one, but, you know, Smith has always loomed large in my way of thinking. It, and I've been more influenced by sculpture than, you know, I'm, I'm more interested in Donatello than the Renaissance painters, for example. That's not to say I don't recognize great quality or I don't admire or I don't look, but I'm talking to what I bring to my own art, the things that I'm looking at that seem to resurface, resurface in my art. And the steel has given me another way of talking about shape, which is something I'm extremely interested in. I'm, I'm interested in what makes something art to begin with, and what materials can be artful, and the history of those materials comes with me. I don't claim to be the first to do anything. And, uh, and the shape, the shape. Um, that's, not, that's also part of the times we live in. Remember that great Elka Selsa commercial, The Shape of Things to Come, and you watched all you watched the jackhammer guy with his belly moving, and you know, remember that commercial? It's about, so, all yeah. about shape, yeah. and so I don't, you know, I think that I think these threads that artists get interested in are really a reflection of the times that they live in, and the humanity that they're hoping to in involve themselves in. So those are my, those are my surface, shadow, um, shape, 
um, those are the things that are my personal are my personal interest and and the steel provides a way of doing that you know and and the color that's happening with the steel is sort of typical of the way I think you know like I have this roast left over from dinner and I can think of 85 ways to make the leftovers it's the same attitude that I have in the studio that I have in the kitchen they really are really the same so I'm very slow moving um, in the studio it doesn't always seem that way because at the end of the year there can be a lot of work but um, I'm as far from one shot painting as you could possibly imagine. Um, not how I envis envisioned things for myself, but I think that the most important thing is to follow your last best thing. So though sometimes I wished I would, were moving in this direction, you can't, I, I can't force myself in any particular way. So well, if in fact the best thing that happened is this thing over here that you wouldn't have thought was where you would go, or do you necessarily even particularly like it? That's the curious thing. You know, you really like this other thing. But what I like and what I'm able to do best aren't always the same, and I've accepted that. I've just, I, and I think, uh, I think that's very important for an artist to do. I think it's accepting what you do best, to be, a, and and following that as, a, a, that road, leads you inward to probably the best that you can, do do. So, uh, I made myself comfortable with that a long time ago. I mean, I dr dreamed about making thin, ethereal, blah, blah, blah. But that wasn't, that wasn't where my future was, is. So, um, so I follow through. I follow through. I'm a better cook than I am a baker. You know, I mean, you start to learn these things about yourself. So, and accept yourself. You know, you're this tall and your hair is this quality and you look like this and you just you have to you get, that's part of of match of the maturation process of being able to accept yourself what your limitations are and where your gifts lie and I think that's that's how you proceed um, sometimes makes it difficult not just for the artist for me but for the public, you know, for my audience, it's sometimes ha hard to follow because there's this kind of work and that kind of work and this kind of work. But I th I, the steel is also helping to inform me about my own painting, which is uh, a surprise, an exciting surprise, because the new material that we've been working on with the Goldens, the synthetic stone type stuff. Um, as excited as I remain about it, and I dream about making three-quarter life-size pieces of, in that material, it didn't inform my picture making to the degree that the steel has. I will add, <clears throat> from in my case, um, as Susan was talking about how it uh, talks to her painting and th we, we both found when we do prints when whenever we step outside of our usual default mode of painting to painting and now I'm going to do another painting and it's much like the last painting but with a little different thing that I thought of in the meantime and that's the usual mode but if then somebody interjects and says hey would you, would you do some prints um, I always say yes to that uh, because every time somebody suggests something that's out of the blue and having to wrestle with that, it always comes back to my art in a way that opens it up and, and, 
and shakes makes you up. it shakes you up and it makes you aware of you, you think you are not forming habits you think you are not doing and repeating yourself you think you're you, you know pushing the envelope but in a certain way you you just naturally become more and more complacent unless you have these things that come in from an outside source and say hey uh, would you do this and then you have to apply yourself to that how do I do that and in doing that when you go back to the thing that you think of yourself as doing it's changed and it's informed and it's like well why didn't you think to do this there and now everything explodes and expands and uh, the other thing I wanted to say about that is um, one of the things that I didn't say earlier when we were talking about the diamonds to the, to the representational and how that transition happened, at least consciously in my mind, how I rationalized it as it was happening, it was about holding the picture together and being able to come back to what I uh, felt was my best, this juxtaposition, juxtaposition of color. Like I said, I like the West Coast painters. I like that kind of color. I like the color that it happened at the edges uh, after layer and layer of color and so on. And, uh, but then there'd be a little hint of the color underneath that, the, that would only occur at the edges. And I, I liked that kind of thing about it. But I also, also liked figures. I liked to do figures. As I said, I was doing figure ground all the whole time. But that's formally in terms of the, the kind of compositions I was coming up with. Um, but literally, I also like figures, you know, like figures. And when I was painting from life, if I had a model, fine. If I didn't have a model and I, and I knew my anatomy, I could do, I can imagine a figure just as easy as a landscape. The trouble is, I can't imagine a figure as fully as I can imagine a landscape with all the nuance. Um, and so it was much easier and much less psychologically complicated <laughs> to do landscape than to do to have a model there, somebody who's interacting at the time of creation. Um, but I found with sculpture, I can do the imagined figure. Um, partly because of the resistance of the steel. Uh, you, with paint, I could make it flow, I could make it be just like old master flesh, you know, Rubens, whatever. You know, I could make it fill out the shape that it is, but, um, and pretty, pretty readily. But with steel, it's not so easy. It takes a lot to bend it and make it smooth and make it go this way, not that way, and you know, whatever, whatever. Uh, and a lot of it, it's just better to work with found than try to form it. You know, Peter is a master and he can pretty much forge his stainless to whatever configuration he wants. Um, I, I don't have that uh, ability, nor even a desire to have that ability. I uh, you know, I like seeing in it rather than forcing it to be a particular something. And there's just enough resistance in the steel and having to find those pieces and still make them conform to and suggest and become a figure that makes sense. And it would have that dynamic that would be missing in imaginary painted figures. Imaginary painted figures would be somehow too quick, too hollow, too ideal, you know, comic book figure type of figures. You know, not, uh, this feels much more real to me. And, and so that was one of the things I relished. I didn't start females till this one here in 2012. Before that, I was doing herons quite a bit, which to me is still a figure. Um, and it's a natural figure, a figure we know from the real world, so that we have relationships and associations with. And uh, so it did the same thing that I was just talking about. I was a little leery of doing, of attempting a female form because more curve, 
more uh, volume when you paint a figure you know Stella's invocation about the corners becomes even worse because a figure is you know two by six or so in proportion something like that and that's pretty long and skinny that means if you have it on any kind of a rectangle that is at all wider than, or as, as approaching as wide as it is high, uh, it's going to be a lot of space that is not what you're painting, uh, or not the main focus. And so you've got to deal with because in painting, if it is well, like in anything, if it's not contributing to it, it's detracting from it, and so. You know, that means the the stuff that isn't the figure has got to be just as important and just as interesting and just as much a part of the solution as the figure itself. So it, it, it left a lot of things. Whereas with this, I can deal just with the the meat, so to speak, of, of, the, of what I'm, I'm being motivated by. And, and that's another thing I speak about and I, just because it related right now at this moment to what I'm saying is how much I get from the myth or the theme or the idea uh, that I'm working to express from. Like this is Radha and it's very important that it's Radha because that informs every decision about what kind of a female figure and what's her attitude and so forth in that the things that is definitely a Hindu Eve, it's not a uh, uh, Jewish um, Israel, um, Western Eve, you know, Judeo Christian Eve, who's very guilty and is about women's original sin and how it got it fixed to the rest of us, and it's about shame and sin. Not Radha. <laughs> Radha is about carnal knowledge. <laughs> It's about the wonderfulness of life and the wonderfulness of this thing that we have that sex and that we have man and woman and, and it's not a shameful thing, it's a glorious thing. And uh, so, and I, I work a lot off of those and I can, those motivations and I can, uh, uh, you know, I use them to, to uh, infuse the work with more. I'm completely out of questions. Uh-oh. <laughs> Can you imagine he's questionless? <laughs>